My name is Roy Heron. I'm 74 years old and have written my very first song. It's a tribute to my wife, Mary, that passed away in 2014 from multiple myeloma cancer. This song, believe it or not, was dictated to me uh, almost four years after her death uh, that I wrote down. And since I wrote down the song, I've had so many things that's been happening from starting the, the day after her memorial service. My sister from Chicago had, had come uh, for services and she got up at four o'clock in the morning and asked me for a favor, which was to borrow my computer and uh, for my printer. She wanted to take all of the notes from the memorial service and uh, reverse them and send them to her email address uh, in Chicago. Then she was gonna type them up and send them back to me for uh, keepsake. And uh, so when she asked me for the favor, I, I got up and uh, my overhead light, you know, has a pull chain. And when I pulled the chain, the light flickered one time. And I said, well, shoot, you know, the light burned out. I said, let me get the table lamp over here so we can, we can see to get to the printer. So once I turned the table lamp on, the wall switch that controls the overhead light sets directly on the wall behind the lamp. And the switches were both in the down position. The light should never have come on at all. So I flipped the switch on and then went back and I was able to pull the light on and it came on and stayed on. So I kind of just blew that off as, you know, a coincidence. I, I made excuses for it and, uh, you know, went on about, about my business. And I guess it was about two months later, I was at the kitchen sink and I started singing this song, Silver Wings by Merle Haggard. And I got about a third way through the song, and then all of a sudden it hit me. That was the first song she and I danced to when we met, on our, and it was on our second date. And when I realized that, I got goosebumps that started on the bottom of my feet, came up the length of my body to the crown of my head, and I could feel her presence, and all I could do was just lay back and just revel in the most wonderful feeling I've ever had in my life. And this lasted for about a minute, a minute and a half, and it just revived me. And again, I got to thinking, and I said, well, you know, I had this memory of that, that this brought back, and that's what triggered the goosebumps. So I still kind of, you know, put it on a back burner, didn't think too much about it. And uh, I guess about a, a year later, um, I awakened from a nap, and uh, I was had my computer on, on uh, the armchair, and the TV was still on. So I looked at the TV and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a slight movement. So I turned my head to see. And at that point, I saw an apparition of my wife. And she says, babe, I want you to go on without me. She says, I'm happy, I'm doing well. And then it just faded. I couldn't believe it. And at this point, you know, I started questioning, you know, do I have my sanity? <laughs> What's going on? And uh, so as we move forward, uh, and she's been gone now for uh, two years, uh, it was on Valentine's Day in February of 17. I had a late lunch, fell asleep, and I slept for almost four hours. And I was awakened by a very, very bright light shining in my left eye. And when I opened my eyes, I was just really blinded and I just kept moving, you know, back and forth trying to figure out where 
this light is coming from. And then I looked and what was happening, there was a single ray of sunshine that was coming in behind my drawn blinds and drapes that struck the side of her urn that was sitting on the mantel and reflected directly back into my eyes. And when I realized that, again, I got goosebumps that started on the bottom of my feet and came up the length of my body. And again, all I could do was just lay back and just enjoy it, the most wonderful, loving feeling I've ever had. Uh, and I, I just felt so good. And I, fortunately, my son was working from home, from home, so I ran into his office and I got him to come and sit in the chair so he could share in that, uh, that moment. So here's, you know, an, another coincidence, uh, perhaps, but I've got witness, you know, to that, uh, you know, as well. Um, during this period of time, I was, uh, you know, trying to clean up a lot of the, the uh, personal effects and I'd already gotten rid of the clothing and, and the things of that nature, but I knew it was time to part with all of the greeting cards that uh, we had received uh, while she was in the hospital. And uh, so I decided I ought to go through the cards and uh, see if there was any from, you know, family that I might want to hang on to. And in that process, I ran across two condolence cards that I had never even knew was that was it was here and they wound up with the greeting cards and so uh when i found out they hadn't been opened i found that they were uh from two of my former high school classmates and i felt so horrible that i had not even acknowledged those and so uh i opened them i got a hold of a friend uh, of mine that still lived in uh, southwestern virginia uh, and he was able to get the email addresses for me for those two classmates. And uh, so what I, I did, I sent them each uh, an email apologizing for not acknowledging. Uh, and of course, they both responded that uh, we understand, no, no problem. And uh, one of the classmates, uh, a, a young lady, uh, you know, mentioned, you know, I've, I've thought about you over the, over the years and, and wonder, you know, where you were living and, and uh, what your uh, number of kids you had and this kind of thing. And so we've, we've been conversing from time to time and in that conversation she asked uh, about my hobbies and I let her know that I sometimes enjoy writing poetry and um, occasionally, you know, I've written a song or two, but uh, nothing that I ever tried to record or even, even publish, you know. Uh, <clears throat> So she challenged me to write her a song. And uh, I, I, I took it, you know, kind of personal that maybe she didn't believe me when I told her that I, I, I write songs from time to time. And uh, uh, so I, I did, and uh, I, I was able to sing it to her, uh, you know, over the phone. Uh, she seemed to, you know, enjoy it. And then she thought that yes, you know, you are a songwriter. I enjoyed that. So in Valentine's Day 2018, uh, I awoke early in the morning. And the first thing I hear is my wife's voice that says, you never wrote me a song. And I froze in my tracks. I could not believe what I was hearing. And she proceeded to basically dictate the song that I've written. And so I, I took the song and I played around, you know, with it. I came up with a tune. But before I got to the tune, I really was thinking it was more like a poem. The following day on February 15th, I awaken. The first thing I hear is <clears throat> Roy, every day, thousands of people receive the same diagnosis you and I got. I'm sorry, but there is no cure. 
I want you to make this into a song. I want it offered to the American Cancer Society, 1A. I want 1B for it to be offered to Oprah Winfrey. Now, not having any experience uh, in uh, music other than singing in, in the high school choir, I set out on a mission to get the song published. I involved three different uh, people to get sheet music written and then to get the song uh, produced and recorded. And after recording, the song was so beautiful and so meaningful to, to me and my family and to friends that I, I was able to play it for. Um, I was encouraged to get it made into a music video. And so we are in the process of finishing up the video to go with the song. But somehow it seemed incomplete and I was encouraged to tell the story about how the song came about. And uh, so that's, that's what we're trying to do right now. There's been a total of six things that happened in the two year period my wife had passed. And uh, since the song was written and recorded, I am now up to a total of 23 different things that has happened in and around the song. It's like connecting dots. And uh, each time something happens, totally unexpected, uh, I, I just have this sense that she's on the other side directing this and making this all happen. Before I move on to all the incidents before, I mean, after the, after the uh, uh, song, uh, I want to jump back and, and uh, tell you about uh, one of the things that really got my attention since I felt like I was making excuses, um, rationalizing, and not total in belief that I was being contacted by her, even though I'd seen the apparition. So this one morning, I was uh, at home around 10 in the morning and watching TV and my, working my computer at the same time. And right next to my chair, there was a very, very loud noise that sounded to me like gunshot. And it really scared me to death. And I could not figure what on earth happened and where it was coming from. At first I thought, well, maybe it's a backfire from a car. And I said, but no, that's, that's not possible because I live too far away from the street for it to be that loud. And so finally I'm convinced it was gunshot. And then I realized that the only way I could have heard that, there had to be someone in the house. And I was quite frightened. So I did get up since my gun was in the bedroom uh, I felt pretty helpless and I went throughout the house and I could not find anything out of order. We'd had an incident, you know, once before in the middle of the night where we'd had a heavy painting that had slid down the wall and broken and that sounded like gunshot. So I thought perhaps. So all day long, I spend the entire day trying to rationalize or come up with a reason for that noise that loud and in the house. I just couldn't. And so by the time my son came home at 8.30 that night from, from work, he checked in with me and how's it going, Dad? I said, well, I'm really not sure. I said, there have been some strange things happening today. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm baffled by it. He said, well, what do you mean strange? I said, well, I heard this noise this morning about about 10 and I said it sounded like gunshot right next to my chair and uh, you know I, I got up and I walked the house I was trying to find evidence either of gunshot or something that would explain and I couldn't find anything I checked every room I checked it twice I went and I made sure I pulled back the uh, the uh, uh, bathroom curtains nothing. I checked the garage. I checked the patio. I could not find an explanation for it. 
And so I've kind of been, you know, a little bit depressed about that, you know, the whole day. So my son just looks at me and he says, really, Dad? Gunshot? Really? And it really just kind of hicked me off. And, uh, of course, he recognized that right, of, right away. And he says, well, I'm, I'm going to the kitchen. I'm going to get something to eat. In a few minutes, he came back and sat down. And, of course, by this time, I'm not even going to talk to him. Started watching TV, and all of a sudden, the noise happened again right next to my chair. Not quite as loud as it had been that morning. And my son's head just turned like on a swivel and said, what was that? I said, that's what I've been trying to tell you. I don't know what it is. And then I started laughing, and he says, well, what's so funny? <laughs> and I said, well, what is, what is so funny, son, is you heard it. So I'm not crazy. I've got a witness, and I am so happy I'm going to bed. So I got up, and I walked to the bedroom. I got next to the bed, and I started undressing. I got my shirt pulled up over my head. And then there was the third noise. Sounded like gunshot. It happened directly behind me. And this time, my son comes running to the bedroom and he wants you to know, did you do that? No, son. I well, what is it? I don't know. I, and I made a joke out of it. I says, the only thing I can figure, your mom is trying to tell me she should have shot my ass the many times I deserved it. You know, but I was so relieved that somebody else heard that. And so moving on forward to the, uh, the song, uh, once I wrote the song, I, I, I really liked it, worked on putting the uh, uh, sound to it. I got a hold of a producer in uh, Denver uh, that was able to write the sheet music. I, I called him over the phone, sang the song uh, to him, and then he was able to, to uh, produce the music and the sheet music for me. And so uh, three producers later, we wound up with the song actually being, uh, being recorded. I approached the American Cancer Society in uh, July the 3rd of 2018, as she had wanted me to do. And I talked to this young lady unannounced, and I played the song for her. Uh, she cried. She complimented the singer and, and her voice. And she says, unfortunately, she says, I'm not the decision maker, so I can't make a decision on whether we could use it or not. And I said, well, can you give me the name and the contact information of the, of the person that, uh, that is the decision maker? She said, yeah, I'd be happy to. Says he's not here in San Antonio. Uh, he lives in Austin, but he frequents uh, San Antonio. So if you give him a call, uh, maybe you can set up a meeting the next time he's in, in uh, San Antonio and you guys can meet and you play the song for him. And I said, okay, I'll be happy to do that. Um, on July the 5th, uh, I had a luncheon uh, appointment with these two ladies that uh, was Mary's best friends and uh, former co-workers. And uh, I had also been working on a couple other other songs, so when I, I took my computer so that I could play the song for them, and we did that sitting in the car at the restaurant, and then we went inside, and I took this folder with me that had the lyrics to these other songs that I wanted to get feedback on. And so when we went in, sat down, placed to order, then I opened my folder, and I was trying to get the lyrics out and let them take a look at it, but it kept hanging up. So what was causing it to hang up was the flyer for the uh, gentleman at the American Cancer Society. So I just yanked it and laid it on the table so I could retrieve the, the uh, lyrics. And when I laid that down, the ladies looked at it and says, oh my God, Roy. I said, oh my God, what? says, don't you know who that is? I says, no, I, I don't. I haven't met him yet. I says, uh, he's the contact person I have with American Cancer Society that I need to 
present the song to him to see if they can use it. And she says, don't you recognize the name? I said, no, not really, I don't. She said, Roy, that is the son of Mary's boss when we all work together. And we sat in stunned silence for about two minutes, and it really put a damper on, you know, on the lunch. We could not get over another coincidence. And uh, so uh, I knew then and there that I had to make contact uh, uh, with him and set an appointment. So on uh, Friday, July the 5th, I did call him. Uh, he answered the phone. And we talked for 25 or 30 minutes, and I told him, uh, I said, now, I don't know if you believe in this kind of stuff or not. I said, I know that I didn't until I experienced it. So uh, I'm, what I'm telling you is I feel like my wife is leading me from the other side to get this song produced. And uh, so that is my mission right, right now. And... Uh, so anyway, we made an appointment over the phone for the uh, couple of weeks down the road when he was going to be in San Antonio. And uh, so I told him, you know, on the phone, I says, you know, up until uh, yesterday, I says, uh, I had six things happen uh, in the two-year period after my wife passed. And since the song started, I've had all these other things. I said, I'm now up to... Uh, 13 different things that has occurred. Uh, you know, a few of those had to do with the singer and, and her path and my wife's path seemed to have, have uh, crossed uh, several different ways. And, and, uh, and so, uh, again, I took that more as a coincidental uh, effect. But <clears throat> I told him, I says, now, after lunch yesterday, I said, I am now up to 14 things that happened. And so he said, uh, do you mind telling me what happened? And I said, well, to be honest with you, David, I says, it really involves you is the 14th thing. And he got a little quiet and he says, Roy, how on earth could it possibly involve me when I don't know you and I don't know your wife? And I said, well, David, is, is, is your dad's name Phil? And he paused and he said, yes, but how did you know that? And I said, well, I really didn't. I said, I took the flyer that uh, I had been given to contact you with and, and I had it in a folder and I pulled it out to get to song lyrics that I was trying to uh, get feedback on and I laid it on the table. And I said, these two ladies I was having lunch with was Mary's best friends and they recognized you. And he said, well, that's weird. I said, well, I thought so too. I said, come to find out, your dad, Phil, was Mary's boss when they worked together. And I said, we were just stunned by that, and, and it put a damper on our, our lunch. But uh, anyway, I said, uh, uh, you know, check with your dad and... and uh, uh, I, I think think he'll get a kick out of that. So a couple of weeks go by, and we uh, were able to get together, and uh, uh, I was able to play the song for David. And his reaction to it, he uh, he teared up uh, quite a bit himself. And I asked, I said, David, who are you thinking of right now? And he says, Well, he says, uh, my grandmother. We just lost her. Uh, a short while ago. And uh, I said, well, the fact that this song is making you emotional, I said, it's doing what I hoped it would do. And uh, it's to show emotion and feel the emotion of it. So as we uh, spent time then just getting acquainted with, uh, with each other, um, you know, we, we talked uh, a little bit uh, uh, about Mary and what she went through and so forth. And I told him a story about uh, her uh, oncologist, and his name is Dr. David Friedman. And I said he's one of the finest human beings I've, I've ever met uh, from the 
first day that he gave us the news there was no cure, he made sure that I had his cell phone number and he told me, I don't care if it's day or night. He says, you call me. He said, now I may not be able to answer if I'm with the patient right away, but I will call you as soon as I possibly can. And uh, he looked and he said, did, did you say Dr. David Freeman? I said, yes. He said, my gosh. He says, I'm supposed to do a special project with him. He said, I haven't met him personally yet, but uh, we're going to be doing a, a project. Uh, and and uh, he said, I just find that fascinating. I said, I said, David, I said, we're now up to number 15, I guess, you know, connecting these dots. And uh, so I asked him, I says, uh, what about um, any other projects you've got going? Anybody else you're going to be working with? And uh, he said, well, he says, actually, he says, we have a new CEO in town that uh, uh, we're going to be doing a project. I'm just giving him some time to get his feet on the ground. And uh, uh, I asked him, I says, so, well, who, who is this company? He said, well, it's uh, Methodist Ministries. And I started laughing, and he looks at me with this blank look, and he says, Roy, he said, I am scared to death to ask why you're laughing. I said, David, you won't believe it. I says, but that new CEO is my son's boss. He says, no way. I says, yes. I said, now, not, not direct boss. Uh, my son is in information systems, and... Obviously, he's a CEO, so everybody works for him. And uh, I